Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming out this afternoon. You could be outside playing outside, but I think this is a very important conversation we're going to have here at the uh, Los Angeles Asia Pacific Film Festival. On behalf of Visual Communications, the uh, nonprofit organization that runs the film festival, I want to say welcome to the 34th Film Festival and to C3 and to this panel, which is called Where Are Our Asian Pacific American and People of Color Film Critics? Um, but it's a conversation that we all felt that we needed to have right about now. It feels like there's a lot that's going on in the film industry, in the media industry, with a lot of our filmmakers and our content creators that are looking like us and coming up with you know, some really great um, product that's coming out. I mean, the, today, the first uh, panel with Crazy Rich Asians, our opening night with, um, with Searching, you know, it's just, it's, it's a time that's going on. So we wanted to gather some of the journalists that are uh, in the media that we need to actually try to support. And then also hopefully to encourage some of you to move into that realm of journalism too, where it can be uh, your perspective that's from a film critic's uh, point of view. So we, we'd like to set this up as a conversation together with these five amazing people. And let me bring them out one at a time here to join us here on the stage. So first of all, we have Jen Yamato from the Los Angeles Times, and she's from the LA Film Critics. And then we'll have Dino Ray Ramos, who's associate editor over at Deadline Hollywood. And then we will have, um, we will have um, Angie Han from uh, Mashable, who just moved here from New York. So welcome to LA. And then we'll have Susan Chang from BuzzFeed News. And then we have Gil Robertson, who's the founder of the African American Film Critics Association. Um, and so basically, I'll give you this too. So basically we'll start off with the panelists talking and if we have time to do uh, any questions, we'll throw it out to the audience. We have about an hour, but we just really feel that at this moment in time, it's a really perfect time for all of us to have this conversation and that we can see who our people are. Jen is over at the LA Times. You probably read a lot of her uh, coverage and a lot of her stories in, in the calendar section. She just did a piece on Aquafina last week and she's actually, one of the people that starts a lot of those conversations when it comes to representation. And we're in a period where representation matters to a lot of us and to a lot of people that's out there and to this newer generation of people that are coming through. So timing is now. And I said on opening night, and I'll say it again here, is that we're in a moment in time where this is change is happening. There are three questions you want to ask, and I'll say it again. One, where were you? Two, what did you say? And three, what did you stand for? Or make it four, what did you do? Because you don't want to wake up in 2022 and look back at 2018 like, ooh, wait, I missed it. And hopefully this is not just a bubble, and hopefully that it will continue and that we'll continue to push forward. So let me just be quiet and let, let me give this on to Jen Yamato. Thank you. I, I also want to thank you, David Magdal. Can we have a hand for Dave, who has been at the center of this community long before I think this community even realized it was a community. And um, I think you are almost single-handedly responsible for radicalizing me in the last few, it's true. Um, so yeah, I love that you said that because now it does feel like a moment. Uh, we're in May, which is APA Heritage Month. We've got, we've got yes. Crazy Rich Asians coming out this summer. Come on, Crazy Rich Asians. We've God, I had other things that I was thinking of. Oh, hashtag I love dogs. We'll get to that. A lot of stuff is happening, and it feels like um, I think more than ever we have more mo mo more momentum as um, as a community, more of a voice. A lot in, in part to, to social media, and um, uh, this opportunity to to learn lessons from other groups that have, have done similar uh, and to really truly be intersectional in our efforts. So I would love to sort of start by asking everybody to kind of talk about how did you get here in your career? And here's my fun prompt. What did you dream of doing when you were a child, when you thought about what you wanted to be when you grew up? 
Uh, this me? Start with that <laughs> one. Dino. Uh, so um, I, um, I kind of grew up in the, um, that generation that's the bastardized generation between Generation X and the Millennials. I think they call them Zillennials. Like X E and I don't know, but um, so like a lot of Asian families or immigrant families, you know, I you know you were expected to go that expected route of pre med, you know that whole narrative. Everyone knows that tired narrative. It's kind of changing now. So I started off as pre med when when I was in, in in college, and I was all I took a chemistry class, and I was all this shit ain't for me, <laughs> and then I just kind of fell into journalism. Um, like, I was like, I like to write, sure. So I um, started writing, and then it kind of just took, I, I went to, I'm from, originally from Texas. Any Texans out there? Nope, okay. Um, so um, I went to Texas A&M, which is actually, when I was there, it was like 90% white. Uh, and I, I majored in journalism, and I kind of just slowly built this kind of, I worked for the newspaper there. I, I, I covered music and TV and, and, um, and, um, film and it was there I think a lot of people when you're in college you kind of have that identity your identity politics start kicking in and that's when I was like oh shit I'm Filipino um, and because I originally hung out with a lot of white people no shade to white people but and when I went to A&M I was like oh you're different you know and also you're a queer person of color which makes it you know double whammy um, if you're a queer woman of color that makes it a triple whammy but like and then that's when I kind of really started kind of just finding my voice. And then after graduating, I went, I kind of just jumped around a little bit. I went to the Bay Area, couldn't find a job, went back to Texas. Bay Area. Bay Area. Yeah, wait, wait, you're from Bay Area? I'm from East Bay. East All Bay right. Area. Come on, East Bay. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, so, and then that's when I, and I actually started covering, I started off as a fashion journalist. I went to Fashion Week. I covered fashion. Uh, but I did that in the background, I kept on covering pop culture. I worked for the Oakland Tribune, I worked for San Francisco Chronicle, and a bunch of local rags there, like 7x7 Seven Seven Magazine, don't know if anyone knows that. And um, just some random, and then I just kind of just, and then three years ago, fast forward three years ago, I was like, oh, I think it's time for me to move to LA. Well, I just went in from fashion to entertainment because I got tired of fashion. And then so just that's went. a natural progression. Yeah, 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 yeah. So fashion to entertainment, and just became a, a you know film critic and a TV um, reporter, like doing everything, um, and was just freelancing all over the place. And then I got into publicity. Then when I moved to LA, I was in publicity, and then wrote for a small site called The Tracking Board. And then Deadline picked me up, and they were just like, "Oh, hey, do this for us." But all along the way, I just kind of had like my identity in the background. I started a podcast called The Off-White Podcast, which um, showcased underrepresented voices in the industry. But then when I got hired at Deadline, they were all, you can't do that anymore. And I was like, oh shit, why not? And they're like, oh, but you could do it for us. So I had a bigger platform to do it on. So now, plugging that, New Hollywood Podcast, look it up. We've had like great guests on there. We had Lena Waithe, we had Darren Chris. Um, and just up and coming underrepresented voices. So that's kind of the spiel. I, I feel like I've been talking for like 30 minutes. So Angie. Let's throw it to Angie. <laughs> yeah, Angie yeah, yeah, yeah. Han, what did you want to be when you, when you were little? Oh, I wouldn't say that I like, grew up wanting to be a film critic. I knew that I had to do something with reading and or writing because those are the only things I'm good at. You should have seen my science grades. Um, and I also knew that like, something about pop culture just seemed inherently fascinating to me, but it didn't come together until I was in college and then I, you know, I joined the school newspaper and like, started doing culture stuff there. And then after graduation, I kind of bounced around for a while until I heard about a job opening at Slash Film, and then I was there for like six or seven years, six years. And I've been at Mashable for the past year. That's, yeah. And, then, oh, and, I, and newly promoted at Mashable. I was recently promoted, which is why I have just moved here. I moved here on Sunday. I don't even have any stuff yet. So I'm very new here. From New York, I should clarify. Yeah. And Susan, what's your story? Um, my story is kind of similar to Angie's. I had always known as a teen that I wanted to write. It was just a matter of figuring out how to make money and convincing my parents that I could do that. And so, you know, I've always liked talking to people. I've always been interested in pop culture. And so I studied journalism in college. And it was actually in college that I saw Phil Yu, angry Asian man, speak. And that was when something in me clicked. 
like seeing someone else, like I'd been reading Angry Asian Man for years, but having him come and talk about, you know, what he's been able to build over the years, that was like a moment for me. It was like, oh shit, there's someone, oh sorry, there's someone out there, you know, who looks like me, who like, and is making a case for why stories about Asian Americans matter. So that was kind of like my, my awakening, I guess. Um, I fell into entertainment writing because after college, uh, BuzzFeed picked me up and like took me under their wing. I started as an assistant, but I saw that there was something missing in our film coverage. There, was n there really weren't any stories being done on Asian Americans, partially because there weren't really Asian Americans in the pop culture or the media, but also there really, except for my colleague Allison Wilmore, who's HAPA, there really wasn't anyone on staff who had the expertise and insight to write about that stuff. Um, and then, you know, I've been there for three and a half years. The rest is kind of history. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, our stories are all similar because I started off uh, as a child enjoying writing. I used to write plays and would perform them for um, family and friends whenever they would come over. And uh, graduated from Cal State LA right up the street and thought that I was going to go to law school, but decided to take a year off, ended up working at a political think tank in Santa Monica, uh, did that for three years and decided that what I really wanted to do was to write. And so I came back to writing and uh, developed a profile for myself as a go-to entertainment journalist. At the time, we're talking about 20 years ago, uh, there weren't a lot of, uh, there weren't really any black uh, A&E journalists in Los Angeles. And so, um, you know, I sort of had to market to myself and was able to leverage that and turn it into a career. And so here we are today. Well, the reason I, I like sharing these stories and peeling back the curtain is because I grew up not knowing that this was like an option. I'm still not sure I would have believed it at the time. Um, and I totally accidentally got here as well, um, sort of guided by my love of movies and pop culture um, and sort of like meandering my way there. But. It is really hard, no matter like what community you come from or belong to or a part of, if you are a marginalized person or underrepresented person in any field, it's really hard to find your way to certain careers if you don't see examples in front of you. So that's one reason why I think it's really great to have this panel for anybody out there who might hear this um, and wonder how they get to this, this, this place, I, I think. I don't know, what would you guys say? Just, just do it. Um, I was sharing with my uh, colleagues here earlier that I recently started a vertical called Kaleidoscope Reviews, which provides an opportunity for uh, critics of color or for any journalists of color to um, really to develop your, your skill sets as, uh, as you know, journalists. And so, uh, you know, please go to the website. It's Kaleidoscope Reviews. Our, you know, you can also feel free to shoot me an email, you know, at Gil Robertson at earthlink.net. But, um... Earthlink? Gil! <laughs> Gil, you gotta get a Gmail. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> we gotta get you a Gmail. You straight up called him. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just do it. Just go for it. I mean, when I was launching my career, uh, you know, you know, I knew I wanted to write. I knew I had something to say. Uh, the only problem is I didn't have any tear sheets. I didn't have any clips. When you go to, I didn't have a portfolio that represented my work as a journalist. And so when I went calling, and most of the publications at that time, much like today, are based in New York. And so when I, I picked up the phone and started calling all of the um, magazines that I want, thought I should be writing for, I got the same answer. Oh, send us your clips, send us your clips. Well, I didn't have any clips because I was just out of, uh, out of college and I had spent the three years since working at this think tank. So I went to a small paper, uh, the LA Sentinel, which is the largest black newspaper in Southern California, and got a list of every black newspaper in the country and set about calling every single one of them with like, look, I will give you free stories. Will you write, will you publish them? And uh, came upon a paper called the Tri-State Defender, which is in Memphis. It's the oldest black newspaper in Memphis. Tim Butler said yes. And so that gave me my first clips, which 
I then sent to New York, which then opened the door to getting some paid opportunities. So really, just do it. Don't let anyone deter you. Your community newspapers, that's what they're there for. They're there to provide opportunities for people who live in your community. So, you know, start off working, for, you know, writing for them for free, but get those tear sheets and just grow it from there. Well, and, and yeah, oh, I mean, the way that, like, when I joined Slashfilm, like, they wanted to see clips, and the, what I had done was I had just started blogging on my own site, like, not for anyone, but, it, like, that's the great thing about right now is, like, like, you don't have to wait for someone to, like, hand you an opportunity on a silver platter. You can just jump into it, put your stuff online, start tweeting at people, you know, like, use social media. Like, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's definitely, you know, th there's something you can do today to get started on that path. Yeah, it's just kind of like... If you're gonna write, just it's kind of like exercising your your talent. Like the more you write, the more you're gonna, you know, get more clips and kind of find your voice and and, and, and get better and get better. Yeah, and like like you said, the, there's so many ways for you to. There's like Squarespace. You could start a YouTube channel. You could just tweet. You could have a Tumblr. There's so many ways just to start writing. So just. If you really kind of are dedicated to it, you know, everything will fall into place. So that kind of leads us to the reason why we're here, which is why do we need more critics of color? Why do we need more diversity in media? What do you guys see around you? What has been your experience? What, how do you see the landscape of not just film criticism, but like entertainment media? Yeah. I think like every newsroom I've been in has been predominantly white. The one thing that I have noticed is that there's a lot of women, which is, which is good. Like, my, my first editor at the Oakland Tribune, it was a woman. And at the Contra Cause of Times, it was a woman. My editor at San Francisco Chronicle was a woman. White women, but they were women. Um, but there, it's overwhelmingly white. Like any other industry, uh, it's overwhelmingly white. But I think the reason why we need journalists of color is just that we need another perspective. There's a, there's a, there's a way to be unbiased and, and cover something like a Crazy Rich Asians or Isle of Dogs, and not and like just report and not use your like Asianness, you know, to you know to kind of as a crutch to report this. Because I, I I'm like kind of equal opportunity. I'll call something trash, whatever, you know, like you know what, no matter what it is, because I'm looking for quality. But um, yeah, I think it's just we need those voices because there's this kind of tired white gaze that has been over uh, entertainment for so long. Like in the newsroom I'm in right now, there's only two people of color. Um, I don't know about you guys and how, what, how diverse your, your um, newsrooms are. But that's my answer. If that it's was okay. even an answer. BuzzFeed newsroom is all right. Um, <laughs> I love all my it's colleagues. It's all right. But I would say this is like sort of you know, I thought about it this morning, why it's important. I think that to have more journalists of color get into the newsroom, it's just, it's not sustainable if you don't have, like, I, I, I went to school with a lot of women of color who wanted to be journalists, but I don't see a lot of them. I think the drop-off rate is so high because these newsrooms aren't really designed to cultivate and foster and support, you know, um, people who have opinions. I know that for me, when I got the job at BuzzFeed, I was just so happy to get my foot in the door. I was like, thank God, I, I, I found a job. And I, like, for a while, didn't really want to be outspoken. I just wanted to, like, kind of fit in and do my job quietly. But, um, and I think that feeling comes from being in a space where there isn't someone you can talk to and bounce ideas off of, right? And so that's why Twitter has really helped my career. You know, I've found community on Twitter. I've met a lot of my good friends through the internet. Um, but how, like, I just feel like journalism could be so much better. Like, our stories, our criticism could be so much richer if we just had that IRL, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, diversity makes the discourse around culture just more interesting, more fun, more important. Like, and one of the things that I, one of the reasons that I love covering pop culture is because I think it's, you know, it, it's a way that it's it's a way that like we as a society see ourselves reflected and think about like what we want our world to look like and what we're afraid it's going to look like and all that stuff. And if you only ever have like white guys kind of putting their thoughts out there, then it, it doesn't work for everyone. So I, I think it's I think it's important for everyone to have a voice. 
Yeah, if you only have white guys writing reviews, then you come to opening weekend of Isle of Dogs, and not a single person <laughs> has like raised any serious criticism about cultural appropriation. Feel free to hashtag all of these, the following conversation. Um, Angie wrote an amazing review, amazingly like balanced review uh, that I thought gave due attention to what I found problematic in Isle of Dogs and your review at Mashable.com um, also sort of like just explores those ideas in ways that like I was way too angry to really, to really talk about um, uh, in any sort of uh, reasonable manner at the time. Uh, but Angie, tell us what that experience was like, diving into the Isle of Dogs sort of fray. Oh, gosh. I was, like, I was talking to another colleague of mine who's also an Asian film critic, and we, we were talking, like, weeks ahead, like, oh, we are dreading this movie coming. We hadn't even seen it, but we're like, you can tell from the trailer, you're like, oh, immediately, like, my guard is up, and I'm worried, and I just know. It's Wes Anderson. All the white guy film critics we know are going to love it. So we're just like, he's eh. quirky, and yeah. he has a point and then, like, of the view. And the thing is, like, I like Wes Anderson. Even so do I. Dog, I totally of, like Wes yeah, Anderson There's movies. a lot of things even about that movie that I like, but then, like, as I started to see more reviews come out, like, it just became clear that there was this, like, blind spot that a lot of people either weren't addressing at all, or sometimes you would see in reviews that they kind of, like, would kind of, like, mention it, but they either weren't interested or didn't feel qualified to talk about it, and it was, it was kind of crazy making, because you're just, like, watching, and you're just, like, there's this really big thing that nobody seems to be talking about, and I saw, I know, like, you were one of the people that were also driving the conversation, because you were tweeting a lot about it. <laughs> which I tweeted like. a few times about that. Wait, movie. who has seen Isle of Dogs in here? Okay. Oh okay. 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 Well, yeah. well, you don't need to see it. But no, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Just joking. If you want to. I mean, like, I. I mean, when I was seeing all the uproar about Isle of Dogs, to be honest, I kind of was so bored with the movie that I kind of didn't care. Which goes back to your, yeah. your point earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I just want a good movie. Yeah, exactly. And I honestly fell asleep, like, twice during that movie. But there's also a story that was, like, it wasn't just me. Multiple people were falling asleep in yeah, that Vulture movie. Yeah, Vulture wrote about yeah. that. Yeah. yeah was, they wrote about how everyone fell asleep. It's a very, like, soothing, quiet movie yeah. among all its Like, it's a beautiful movie. Yeah, it, he makes beautiful stop-motion animation stuff. But when I was watching it, I was just like, oh, oh, my God, I'm so bored. And it's like, I can't care like i mean i i just can't i mean the dogs were cute right very cute yeah, yeah that was my review dogs are cute and did you notice it's i love dogs yes, I yes. I, you know everybody <laughs> noticed that everybody it was like i just got on that Twitter. soon i just got that right now i'm slow okay well my frustration at the time was that aside from angie's review and aside from my colleague justin chang and la times review there are so few critics working critics at mainstream outlets discussing these things with any sort of nuance or depth. Um, and that's a really frustrating thing, to, to feel like you belong to this, this community of film criticism. And as much as I hate to admit it, belonging to film Twitter. Don't like to admit it very often. Um, but it's true. And uh, to see all of these sort of media peers sort of gloss over this thing which directly affects my identity was a really, really alienating and disappointing thing. And it's easy to feel lonely when you are, you know, one of only a handful of Asian critics that you can even see on the Rotten Tomatoes tomato meter. Yeah, so I remember when it came out, I was, I, I think I told like Inko Kang or something, I was just like, Asian American film Twitter is keeping me sane right now yeah, because otherwise absolutely. Was, I'm like, no one, is, no one seems to be seeing this thing. Um, but like when I, was when I was writing it, one thing that I really had to keep in mind was like, I had to remember that I, need to explain why this matters and why it's important. It's not just enough to be like, oh, there's cultural appropriation. You have to explain to people, especially like when you were talking about mainstream audiences who don't automatically care about this. It doesn't directly affect them. Like I tried really hard to be like, this is okay, but this is also why this is a conversation worth having and not just being like, anyway, this is a thing that happened. Doesn't matter. We can shove it off to the side. But I think you see with like a lot of recent examples, like uh, the value of having diversity of all kinds and criticism has this direct, beautiful, symbiotic relationship with films and filmmakers. Um, you see critics of a certain community might be more interested in even watching a small indie film um, uh, from, a, from that community or something like that. You know, the, more representation in media, I think, 
it's obvious it leads to more representation in, in film and the kind of films that are celebrated and even talked about. Uh, Gil, what, I mean, you have so much experience. What's, what have you seen as the, like, that relationship come, come to, to fruition? Well, you know, Jen, like I've t told you the other day over the phone, and like I'll say again today, without, um, I've worked in a newsroom, in a trade newsroom, and know how these things get passed around and how they get prioritized. And unless you're someone who gives a damn, to be quite honest, it's just gonna be thrown out, it's just gonna be put aside. And AFCA, the organization that I run, the African American Film Critics Association, we would have never gotten in deadline had it not been for you. That's because you took the time to understand that there was a need to have this conversation, that there was a need to give some exposure to the work that we do. So it is absolutely critically important that we have, that newsrooms have Asian, black, Hispanic, Muslim, LGBT people in those spaces because um, that's the only way that those stories are gonna really get out there. Otherwise, they're gonna be ignored. I have been in this game for 20 plus years. I won't say how many into 20, but 20 plus. And um, it's just the way it's been. It's the way it was and the way it still is. And so I'm just so, uh, I'm tickled pink at, you know, the, that we have this growing number of, of uh, journalists of color who are covering A&E. It's just, it's such a thrill. Well, I, I actually wanted to ask David a question because I don't know if you guys know this, but Dave's been in this game for, for a long time and he's been, he's been like at the center of so many Asian film success stories that are, because you put your heart into, into spreading the word about movies and getting them seen. I want to ask you about your experience with Justin Lin's first, second, second movie? Better Luck Tomorrow at Sundance, um, which I know like you told me once that you were on the publicity team at Sundance, world premiere, um, in a place like a festival like Sundance, you have to like really hustle to get it even seen, to get critics in the theater, just to get them to maybe cover it. What was your sort of like your your approach to that, and how has that changed over the the years? You know, th that was kind of like a, an anomaly. I mean, because there was a moment that happened at at Sundance uh, that actually went kind of like before Twitter and before the internet was really big, and we were. I'm sure you guys have seen it where. Uh, we're at uh, one of the Q and A's, and I think it was the third Q and A that we had done, and it was starting to like go down and down. I mean, the film had already pissed off a lot of people because, you know, there was a murder scene, and we're not supposed to be killing people, but now we got the assassination of Gianni Versace, Asians kill, so we got that going on. No, but but back then it was not like it was they, they had bust, you know, they busted the model minority um, stereotype, and so. At this one uh, screening that we did, it was the third screening at the library in Park City, and it would finished. And this one uh, critic got up and said, basically, and I don't remember word for word, it was such a long time ago, 15 years ago, it was a, a, a white critic who got up and said, you know, you should be ashamed of yourself. How did you make this movie about these, you know, kids? You know, your parents would not would really feel ashamed of you. And it was interesting because those audiences at Sundance were like they took him to task as well. But it was Roger Ebert who got up on his chair. And luckily, we had someone <laughs> that was filming it at the oh. same time, because we had been following the journey, because like, we were all excited, because here's a, one of the few first Asian American films that was actually in competition at Sundance. And said, okay, well, let's film this journey. And Justin was really smart about it. Like, let's just follow this, you know, let's see where this is gonna go. So we filmed this, and Roger Ebert gets up and screams, because everybody was like, you know, he says, look, you know, this, this uh, Asian American filmmaker does not have to represent his community. So what we did, as the, as the uh, publicists that we are, we took this, we took the video that we had, we sent people to the Entertainment Weekly party who could just go through and like, start talking to people we knew. So Eugene Hernandez was with IndieWire back in the day. That was when we used to get IndieWire underneath our hotels on, on a Xeroxed paper. And so they would go around and tell, and they went to the, Entertainment Weekly Party to tell people this is what look what happened here. Roger Ebert got up on his chair. We went that night and we duped 
it was like probably about five minutes on, we went to, back then it was Albertsons, we went to the Albertsons, that was 24 hours, and got like VHS tapes and just dubbed everything. <laughs> and we put all that in all the different journalists' uh, mailbox over at Sundance. And so we were able to, to get it out in that way. And that kind of went viral. And that was actually the turning point, I think, for this when MTV said, oh, we need to pick this up. But also for us as a community, it was a waking up point. Because everyone was like, okay, we all have to go see this. And then it took us a year once MTV bought it and then Paramount got it. And then we, it took us a year. But what we did was we went and did played almost every Asian American film festival. Got everybody also excited about it. You got, it was the first time for us to see male, uh, Asian American male actors on, on, the, on the big screen and not playing just the nerd, but actually were kind of crazy, sexy, wild, wild guys. So it was a turning point, but it's 15 years ago. You know, that, that was all part of that. And of course, Justin's career takes off. And you know, if you take a look at the trajectory of his films, a lot of there's an Asian American-ness to his films, even though it's Fast and Furious and Star Trek. But there's something that's very Asian American about his films. And if you take a look at it and you start looking at this, you will see how that rolls out. And I mean, Tokyo Drift, when he got to chance to do it, he had turned down a bunch of Fast and Furious, and it's your favorite movie. <laughs> um, but when they did that, I mean, he, he turned it on its head and re, you know, helped to rewrite what that was going to be. All of a sudden, it became one of the sexier things that people kind of like decided to go after. But we were talking in our office, and I do publicity for my regular job, and I work a lot on documentaries and a lot of uh, you know, studio films, and oftentimes I get called to work on films that have Chow Yun-Fat, Jet Li, um, whoever the hot Korean person is, because I look like I look. I'm one of the few Asian Americans that are in publicity. And so they're like, oh, hey, let's give it to David. He, his team can run with it. And also, you know, we know a lot of the Asian journalists, so you know, we get to play in that field. So I hope we met John Chu. We worked on Now You See Me Too, because there was somebody that was in there that was a pop star, and we were able to... Jay Chow. Yeah, Jay Chow, thank you. And we were able to do that. But what's interesting is now there's this, like, there's this moment where I want to see more people that look like me doing publicity. And not just because it's going to be like, oh, yeah, give him the Asian. I'm glad to take the Asian role because I, don't, I can play in that role, but also it allows me to be there. But also I find that for our, our, um, our journalists get excited when we get to invite them. So like you guys. So when we did Gook last year, I definitely had... Susan was there, and we had a bunch of other people that we said, okay, who, and the question was, well, who else uh, from an Asian American perspective can we go to that will actually write about this film and have that perspective? Because I think, and that was the thing we discussed in our office, this is so lacking, and we were hearing people up at Sundance this year complain, especially if there were people of color journalists who may not, have, maybe there's like nerds of color, or these, it's not your mainstream status quo, like how come I didn't get invited to that junket? And why aren't I on, you know, that list? And it's like you said, why weren't you invited to when they did the big, mm. big promotion around um, a Crazy Rich Asians yeah. recently? Part of the problem is no one knows who we are. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to make sure that we had this panel and amongst you people here because that hashtag that we, we attached to this, which was Asian American Creator Roll Call, so a hashtag as am Creator Roll Call, is an opportunity for all of you who are writers and directors, artists, to you know, name check yourself, throw it up on Twitter. And it's an opportunity for all of us as consumers and your audiences to know who you are so you can represent on both sides. But we, my question for you guys is really, whose responsibility is it then to grow journalists like you? You guys are talking about, oh, we're the only people in the room so what can we do to change that so you're not the only person in the room? And then you talk about how difficult it is because you want to interview someone like an Ava DuVernay, but you know that someone else bigger than you wants to do that because now she's a big name, yeah. right? You know, when she was doing Middle of Nowhere, she was getting to be, but now she's all of a sudden she's, you know, they were like, oh, here, let's give it to Dino. Yeah. But now it's like, oh, no, so-and-so will go take it now. Yeah, that, that, like a lot, ha that has a lot to do with seniority. And don't get me wrong, you know, that's fine. But, you know, I've... It just kind of sucks when you've been working on something, trying to get an Ava DuVernay to come on your podcast for like months, and then someone who is your senior at the job swoops in and says, hey, you can't do that. She's going to be interviewed by me instead. So imagine how that feels. And then like even some people in my, uh, my colleagues were just like, oh, he, I'm not going to name names. <laughs> um, but like he's like, oh, he is the least qualified person to interview Ava DuVernay. You should be interviewing him. And like, 
I, I can't disagree with that. But I understand that in every industry, you kind of have to play this game. And I mean, I've been doing journalism maybe about like 14, 15 years, and I'm like, oh, I'm kind of tired of that game, you know? Granted, I've only been in the LA game for about three or four, three years. I've kind of, I, I came here hitting the ground running. I knew what I needed to do, and like, in like three years, I'm like at one one of the major trades in Hollywood, and, and um, you know, just trying to make a change. And um, that's why we have our new Hollywood podcast, where we just um, we are like adamant on getting people of color, LGBT people, you know, any marginalized community on that, so that we could lift them up because it's a platform, like no other trade, I don't think THR or, or Variety has a, 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 um, a, um, a podcast like that. So it's a, it's a good platform for these people who aren't being heard to get, you know, to get in the spotlight and at the same time to have like me and my co-host, Amanda Nduka, who's, uh, she, she's, she's black and you know, I'm Filipino and we're the only two people of color there and kind of to get our face is out there to be all, oh, Deadline do, does have some black and brown people. Let's go contact them. So, you know, I don't know if I answered your question. But it's called know, New you know, Hollywood. I, I, have to, I have to say how important it is to stand your ground. Yeah. Yeah. And I know working in those environments, uh, even during the early part of my career, my attitude was I'm qualified for you to have me sit in this chair. I'm gonna be qualified to speak to an Ava DuVernay or to whomever I may want to speak to because, I, you know, because I'm qualified. And you, so sometimes you've got to be willing to push back you know, against those notions that senior, senior management can only talk to certain people and just simply stand your ground. And either you, if you want me here, I need to have access to whoever, you know, from the top to the bottom. Well, I, I have to say that uh, the the sort of fine line struggle between tokenism and responsibility yeah. is something that I still struggle with yeah, in exactly. my work. Um, I feel very, very grateful that at LA Times I have the freedom, as like all of our entertainment writers, we, I, I'm sure they, they would agree, uh, we have the freedom to write stories that are important to us, to pitch stories that we think are interesting. And um, it's not so competitive. Uh, you don't have stories taken away from you, stuff like that, because there's plenty of stories to go around. There are plenty of interesting films and people to, talk, to think about, to write about. Um, so I have a lot of freedom. What do I do with that freedom as a journalist? Um, do I only write about Asian stories? Do I only write about diversity stories? No. Sometimes I want to write about dumb horror movies or, you know, like other groups other than Asians. And um, so I do as much as I can, but that is a constant sort of struggle and something that, that uh, I've been thinking a lot more about in the last few years, especially since like Twitter communities have become so much more important um, in me feeling less alone, as you mentioned. Um, the idea of taking responsibility as being part of a community and having a platform and how do you exercise what power you do have to write stories about certain, certain filmmakers or people or whatever. So that's something that I struggle with. I don't want to be the, the Asian person. I'm not the only Asian person at the LA Times, <laughs> which is really nice, um, but I am the only Asian woman. Um, wait, is that true? God. Uh, so yeah, that's something that I that I still don't know quite the answer to, but um, I don't know. What do you guys think, Angie? Your career has been so deep in the I would say the nerd game, the geek the, the world, white, the white dude nerd <laughs> guy yeah. people. Yes, Angie and I have known each other for a long time because we both come from the internet. <laughs> we both come from the internet. <laughs> we, come, we come from the in, we come from internet. Yes, uh, I'm actually an AI. I'm not <laughs> a real person. But you know, like, Sentient like internet being that, we're, like, we've both known that geek world. Yes, yes. Writing about superhero movies and going to Comic Con, which I love. But that also kind of gives, I think, it's a different world than like the trade world that Dino's in. Yeah. What's been your experience in terms of like the stories that you feel like you are are like empowered to write, 
the stories you want to write within I mean, it's like you said, like I, you know, so I write a lot of, a lot about like superhero movies, blockbustery, like Star Wars, like that kind of stuff. Like that's, that's what I, that's what I mostly write about and that's what I specialize in, I guess. Um, but there are, it, it does, it, it, so especially at my previous site, at my current site, I'm, it, it's a little bit more diverse. I work with some women, including another woman of color. And my uh, immediate team is pretty small, but we're a little bit more mixed. At the previous site that I was at, it was me and a bunch of uh, white guys. And they're very nice, but they don't uh, necessarily think to hit upon some of the same things that I did. And so it always did feel like whenever a movie came out, I was just like, if there's something in here that I have to write about, like, you know, oh, let's talk about this from a feminist perspective, or like, let's talk about like, you know, what's going on with like the race stuff in this movie. Like it always did feel like it fell on me, not in a way where they were like refusing to do it, but in a way where it would just wouldn't occur to them that this is a thing to write about. Like they just like would watch the entire movie and not notice anything was amiss or like that anything was uh, revolutionary on the other side of it. Sometimes it's a good thing. Um, so it always did feel like it was me. And it, it, it for a while, like I think early in my career, I did kind of struggle with them. Like, do I want to be like the critic who's like, you know, do I want to be like the Asian female critic? Like, is that going to be my identity? Because I didn't want to just be pigeonholed into only writing about those issues. I want to write about, as you said, like all sorts of stuff so yeah Susan what about at BuzzFeed what's it like to like pitch because you've done so many great stories on different different like areas of representation different conversations about different kinds of inclusion that is really necessary in the entertainment industry um yeah I've recently started branching out um because I feel like I did hit a point where I wasn't really growing and I didn't really have like I'd already cultivated a beat, and you know, you hit a ceiling or you whatever. Um, I have a lot of freedom at BuzzFeed. I struggle with exactly what you're talking about, that tokenism. I feel like everyone here probably does. Um, like, I can remember Crazy Rich Asians. Um, I had like emailed my entire team being like, hey, this movie's coming out. I don't, I, I've already interviewed John M. Chu. Like, y'all should do something. And so I feel like. We're at this point where um, I love my colleagues, but I do. I wonder if people are now nervous about writing about you know an identity that's not theirs. And I think it's like a fine line. You know, I'm not really sure what the answer is. Yeah, sadly, um, being a number of years older than most of you, you know, uh, taking on that role is just something that throughout my career I've accepted that I'm going to have to. Um, navigate that and if I'm gonna have to be the person to to shoulder that responsibility in terms of telling those stories and also identifying next-gen talent who will come in to replace me and so I mean hopefully things are changing now in newsrooms I don't work in a newsroom anymore but hopefully the environment is getting a lot easier uh, and you, you don't feel that burden you know, but you're speaking of it, so apparently it's still there. It still persists. Well, I kind of think it's kind of a self-imposed burden sometimes. I more think it's so. a little of both. Like yeah. I write about these things because I'm interested in them, and I think they're important and exciting and fun to write about. And also because I feel like if I don't do it, no one else is going to do it. Sometimes. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I feel the same way too. Like we were when we were talking last week about, like, if any LGBT glad thing comes in, that immediately gets thrown my way or if anything Asian comes in, that immediately gets thrown my way. Even anything people of color gets thrown, uh, like it gets thrown my way, which I don't mind, but then you question yourself, like it's self-imposed. Like you said, you're like, oh, is, is this me? Is, is this like what, is this all I'm good for? But then again, I'm not. I'm like, I still do all the other stories on Deadline. I like write boring stories about executive moves. I write, I write like, oh, this rating for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. went down. So like very insider baseball, boring, it's not boring, some people like it, but you know, just like very industry stuff that people, people read. But then again, I, I still, they'll like, like the, just the other day, my, my boss was like, hey, is this LGBTQ um, festival worth writing about? And it was a valid question because it was in Toronto and I was just like, oh, I don't think so. I mean, just because I was like, I think about it from an editorial perspective. I'm just like, oh, if we write about them, we have to write about every single LGBT festival. And that's in Toronto, it's not even in LA. So I was just like, oh, we're gonna pass on it for now. But you know, it's kind of making those decisions as well. But still, I still have that, you know. But, but I also yeah. see like 
the four of you and you know that are in those newsrooms or in those places as an opportunity. Yeah. And so yes, it's like you said, it's a, du a double burden. It's like, oh, do I want to be this only person there? But I also look at it as like it can be part of whatever addition to it. Just so I don't think it's a take. Like like oh, it's a token thing. It's like no, you're there. Yeah. I'm like when you got hired there, I was like. It's about time, you know. Plus, I know I know your perspective, and I thought, okay, good. They're adding some flavor to you know to deadline. You left, and so we said, oh shit. They were like, oh, we need to replace yeah, this agent with no, another so one. Jen was gone, but then you were at <laughs> you were at the L.A. Times, and I know that was also really hard because that's a mainstream kind of paper. But then about a couple of years ago, when the Oscars so white stuff kind of popped through, I saw you grow, and you said, okay, I'm going to put myself out on the block and step out. A lot, and I think during that whole time period when all that happened, a lot of people put themselves out, out on, the, on the line, and you did as a journalist. And because you didn't have to, and they had that, you guys did that thing with you and Justin Chang talked about that. And Justin, and he's been there a long time, I think it was also hard for him to own his Asianness within the newspaper at some point. But then I think when that piece, that article you guys did, it changed for both of you. Yeah, and I think I think for you guys, I think it, I see you guys as an opportunity for for us as people who are filmmakers that we know that you'll get what we're going to be doing. For those of us who are publicists that are looking for someone who can have that perspective to bring it, so I always look every time I see someone that looks like me or that is different or is from a marginalized community that it is in a space where there is a mainstream thing that that's an opportunity. And I think, you know, for you, it's like it's a double burden. And it's interesting because there was the woman on uh, Crazy Rich Asians today who wrote the screenplay. And she said she didn't want to be the only Asian person. But I'm looking at a generation of people, and you guys are all out here, who aren't afraid of being the only, only, whatever it is, only female, only Asian, only LGBTQ, XYZ person out there. You know, you're taking that risk. Because I think we've lived so long in the past of everybody who doesn't want to be first. And now, and I think that's the other thing too that I wanted to bring you guys out here so that you can see that you're not alone, that you do have a voice, but you've got people that will support you. Because I think that's most important, and I think that's important for us. Uh, go ahead. Oh, no. So I, just, I think, you know, at this point, you know, I would like to take some questions because we don't have a whole lot of time, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, if you have a question in the audience, raise your hand. Meanwhile, I do want to ask Gil um, because you really blazed a trail. <laughs> You and Sean Edwards, 15 years ago, formed the African American Film Critics Association. And by the way, your annual Critics Awards dinner, I think is the best critic event of the year because it's so, it's so well-rounded. It's, it's got such intention. Mm -hmm. The chicken is delicious. <laughs> and... But like you have a real sense of like really integrating and synergizing the entire community and knowing that the community isn't just film critics, it's also film critics, filmmakers, audience, next generation filmmakers, next generation critics of all, of all kinds. So I would love to hear while we wait to see if anybody has questions, I would love to hear Gil, what, what was the impetus for starting AFCA and how, how did you guys go about doing it? Well, uh, and thank you, Jen. That's so sweet of you. Um, really, uh, representation. There was no representation for uh, black film critics. And so uh, Sean and I took it upon ourselves to uh, put together this collective, which has grown into the organization, so that we would have a voice and be able to get behind issues that were important to us uh, as black journalists. And um, so, yeah, that was really the reason. You know, also, as a resource for next gen talent. You know, it was, it's very difficult to navigate, you know, this terrain. And um, personally, I felt that uh, it was sort of like our give back, a way of, of hopefully having younger black uh, journalists or other journalists of color be able to tap into uh, our organization and um, for us to be able to offer them support as they build their careers. But it's been difficult. It's been very difficult getting you know, the studio system uh, to take us seriously. Uh, we're about to celebrate our 10th, our, we're 15 years old as of uh, this year, and we're going, well, as of next year, and we'll also be celebrating our 10th year of having our dinner. But it has not been an easy ride. But um, you, know, you just have to, when it gets tough, you just have to get tougher. A question right here in the front row. 
Heck no. Thank you for your question. Great question. Yeah, that is and a great question. And if I may sort of repeat it and not re fully remember best how to say it, uh, the idea that a lot of people, and you mentioned Karen Tran writing Teen Vogue, but the idea that Crazy Rich Asians coming out this August is going to be the Asian Black Panther has been a really interesting discussion. Um, I, I personally, and, and I, don't, I don't think that there's going to be any sort of backlash against black Twitter, as, as you asked. I don't think that's, to me, that's not a component of it. To me, it's like apples and oranges. They're both delicious, and we need more of both of them. Um, and uh, to me, black Twitter, African-American Twitter, uh, both on the consumer side and the media side, has been really inspiring. Um, I think we can take a lot of cues from from that community um, and how they uh, how everybody rallied around Black Panther. I cried watching Black Panther. Mm. I didn't see myself up there. I saw myself up there in Crazy Rich Asians, kind of, but not really, because um, I'm not, you know, I'm Japanese American. Um, anyways, I'm rambling because I'm very excited about this question. It's a great question. Yeah. Crazy Rich Asians is not going to be the Asian Black Panther, but it was never going to be. Hopefully, I do think that studios want everybody to write about it. It's a mainstream, wide-release, romantic comedy studio, big-budget studio, uh, potentially blockbuster, and it just happens to star Asian people and, and be about Asian characters. Yeah, but remember, yeah, yeah. Asian oh. culture was represented in, in Black Panther. The scenes oh. in Korea. Oh, right. oh that's Cooper right. Did that. And I think like one of like uh, like there's like a set design or someone took uh, inspiration from mm -hmm. Filipino tribes for the yeah. for the costuming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but yeah, I totally like when people are starting to say that Crazy Rich Asians is going to be the uh, the Asian Black Panther. I'm like, oh no, it's not. I get it yeah. though, because you want that yeah, yeah. kind of phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. You want that the kind of reach. Of the, it's going to uh, be empowering in a different way, I think. Um, because like when they announced the casting, I admitted I was all, "Is this going to turn into the?" Because like just the casting alone was like, because you know, Asian Black Panther had almost like every single Asian. I mean, I'm a black actor in it or whatever. But like when they were announcing the Crazy Rich Asian cast, I was like, "Oh, this is turning into like a Black Panther situation in terms of like all these Asian actors are getting jobs." So in that aspect, yes, maybe, but I don't think it's going to be empowering in a different way. I think you know. Um, but yeah, you guys have anything to say? C R A. What do you guys think? Yeah. You know, it's cool. It's a romantic comedy. I mean, you know, that's why it was so important for AFCA last year to recognize Gook, because as a black organization, there seems to be this, like, this perception that there's tension, that black people don't like Asians. And we actually sat down and had this meet, this conversation when we were putting together our top 10 list. And when we put Gook out there, I was pleasantly surprised that a majority of our organization really wanted to get behind the movie and send a message. We were very deliberate in having, including that film on our list, on our top 10 list, because we wanted to let people know, you know we are, you know, we're celebrating everything that's quality, be it Asian, Hispanic, LGBT, Muslim, and so, so yeah. Look, Wonder Woman was a huge moment too for, for women, so it, to me it's kind of, those movies are similar. <laughs> Didn't make Susan? Yeah, I don't think that notion came out of anything malicious, but I think it's like a not correct comparison. Um, but I saw Crazy Rich Asians, and I did kind of look at it like as this movie is going to be the closest thing in a while that we get to Asian American superheroes. You know what I mean? Um, like all the characters in that film are so different and they're their own individuals that it does feel like, oh, it's like their origin story. A mm. uh, question in the back corner. What do we, to repeat the question, kind of, is uh, we mentioned the symbiotic relationship, beneficial, I think, uh, between critics of color and films of color, film, filmmakers of color. Um, how do you guys see that relationship? 
Well, I think it goes back for me to like it has to be a good film. I mean, I, I, I don't know if like I'll get dragged for saying this, but just because you're Asian, you're an Asian filmmaker or a, a, a filmmaker of color, it doesn't mean I'm automatically gonna like your film. <laughs> I mean, I have to be fair. I have to, you know, report on it fairly just as I do everyone else. I'm not going to have a bias, but, you know, I'm going to support you. I'm going to do it for the culture, as they say. But um, that's how I feel about kind of having relationships with, you know, filmmakers of color. Or, um, But I, like I said, I'm just like an equal opportunity hater. Um, <laughs> um, no, um, just kidding. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, but yeah, I'm just going to treat it as fairly as possible. I mean, like, I, I'll support everyone just as long as you do something dope. <laughs> yeah, I don't support everyone either, so, you know what? <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't think any filmmaker would say they, like, want a film critic of color to go easier on them just because they're a filmmaker of color and vice versa or anything. Um, but at the same, so, you know, I'm with you. Like, I, it still has to be a good movie, but at the same time, I, like, do I think that I might be slightly more likely than a white guy to like kind of seek something out or for something to like ping my radar in a way it doesn't? I think, yeah. And then like, am I then, if I like it, a little bit more likely to be a little bit louder about it? Like, probably. And not even just like I guess a conscious choice of like me being like, oh, you know, as an Asian person, I must like go out and really promote this Asian movie. But just, you know, it's, it speaks to me. It speaks to my interest. It's something that I will probably pick up on that not everyone else will. And I, so I think that that's, that's kind of the relationship for me. I just wanted to bring up, I'm not a film critic, but I wrote um, an oral history on the Joy Luck Club. It was so good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and what was so weird to me about that was that was the last uh, Hollywood film to star an all-Asian cast. And it was a great film, I think. Um, but I wonder if the lack of Asian-American film critics at the time contributed to the reason why there hasn't been one in over 20, another one in over 20 years, you know what I mean? Um, and this panel's about the need for more diversity in film criticism, and I feel like that is a good example. You know, I think that, uh, I remember getting on a, a, waiting for a valet service one day in Beverly Hills, and it was in the same building that the producers of the Joy Luck Club were worked in and uh, we got into a conversation. I think she was holding a book, a white woman. And I said, oh my God, that's one of my favorite movies. And she looked at me like, how could it be? Again, going back to this idea of how could you relate to this universal story about people living their lives? You know, you're a black man. And I think perhaps, you know, that's the reason why you have them because there weren't, I think people were afraid of it much in the same way that they're afraid of a lot of black cinema. Oh, well, only black people are going to watch it. Only Asian people are gonna watch it. I can quote Joy Luck Club. That's how many times I've seen it, but. That's amazing. You know, we live in these silos where we refuse to understand that people just love quality, well-told, well-executed stories. It has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. So perhaps that's the reason. I will say though, like you go to some place like Sundance and the first screening of a tiny indie movie that needs critical support to get a distribution deal or to get a, like publicity or to be seen, um, that's where I feel like one of the places where we need more diversity and criticism is those first audiences that have such power to, to amplify quality stories and, and storytellers that might not otherwise be noticed. Um, so we're kind of out of time. Do you have a quick question? Oh, just on that fact, like, I'm, I'm an independent filmmaker, and I'm just like, curious as to, like, if you have like, a project that you feel like, strongly about, do you have to Crazy Rich Asians is going to be seen by like every major outlet and and critic. Um, I I would recommend an indie filmmaker get somebody like David Magdale on his team. Um, but occasionally I do get cold emails from indie filmmakers just sort of pitching their movie and asking to to for me to take a look. And I will open all of those emails and I will occasionally reach out. So I would encourage that if you're like really on your hustle to get your movie like seen and talked about. 
Um, thank you for that question. If anybody has anything to add, I'm, to I'm that. the same. As, like I open all emails, like you know, and it, I'm I'm willing to give things a chance. Like especially if it's like genre driven, I'm very like nerdy like that, and, or something that's like, very very interesting to me. And like, it doesn't have to be behind a big studio. Just as long as it's an awesome story, and like, a, a lot of some people are really persistent. They'll send like an email a week, and I'll be all fine. I'll find you know you know. Don't do that. Yeah. Don't send me an email every <laughs> single week. But, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm willing to give things a chance. That's the, I think that's the bottom line for me. Well, I'm sorry we're out of time, but we will be around for a little bit if anybody wants to talk afterwards. We want to ask everybody to go down and add your final thoughts on the topic, on everything we talked about, anything that you wanted to add, and where people can find you. Oh, oh um, you could reach me, Dino Ray, on all platforms, D-I-N-O-R-A-Y. I post some ratchet ass shit on Instagram. And um, I'm on Twitter, Dino Ray. Um, and listen to the new Hollywood podcast, please, because, you know, I, we really want it, because Deadline is such a big platform, especially for the industry. We have some awesome guests. Uh, next week's guest is going to be Justin Simeon, Dear White People. And we have a bunch of, like, um, cast members coming on, Logan Browning. And it's... It's going to be pretty dope. So please listen to Hollywood Podcast. Look it up. It's on Deadline. Or just tweet at me. I'm always on Twitter. I'm bored. <laughs> I am also always on Twitter. I'm A-J-H-A-N. Um, and you can find my writing at Mashable.com. I'm on Twitter. Um, doing an <laughs> I'm You sound real sad about it. <laughs> it's not fun. It's sometimes fun. I'm S Chang underscore... And you had said any closing state. I think that um, keep engaging in the conversation, keep tweeting, write, like start a blog, because studios care now, you know? Like there are, st studios care, period. And it matters. Like I remember during like the whitewashing scandal of 2016, um, Keith Chow from the Nerds of Color um, he got whitewashed out trending, and everyone covered it, and that was amazing. So, yeah, it matters. Oh, can I add something? Uh, I mean, like, whether you're a filmmaker or a critic, I mean, just, just this panel has been really, like, nice to remember that there's a whole community out there. Like, it's not just all of us individually trying to make it in a white guy's world or something. Uh, Gil Robertson. Uh, oh, you want my, I'm uh, giving my email, my Earthlink email again. <laughs> You can find me at Dino Ray at Netscape.com. Right. No, it's AAFCA on Instagram. Uh, and on Twitter, it's The AFCA. T H E A A F C A. And this has been fantastic. Uh, David, thank you. thank you. And we need to see, we didn't even get into the fact that we need to see more Asian. Uh, Asian American. Oh, yeah, we need publicists. we need some more Asian American publicists, definitely, because I think there's a perspective there. And yeah, there's a whole education. That's a whole other panel. Yeah. Next year we need to do a. Next Jen, you need to moderate a master yeah, class. Have that. Moderate I want a master say, class with David. Yeah, there we go. Uh, can we just say my final thought is: Look, this festival is for you. All of this is for all of us. And so you know, take the time today or tomorrow if you're going to anything and talk to other people. Look around the room. You guys are all in here for a purpose, and you all came for the same thing. So these are the creators that are here. There are those of us who are journalists here. Those of us who are running nonprofits. This is our moment. This is the community that you belong to. And it's open. And everyone's looking for your story. And everybody's looking for your input. So now is the time. I want to say thank you for all you guys taking the time. Oh, wait. Jen has final thoughts. Sorry, Jen has final thoughts. Um, you can find me. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> you can find me at Jen Yamato. Um, and my final thought is I want to give a shout out to some, but definitely not anywhere near all of the people in this community, filmmakers, um, activists, journalists, who I find really inspiring and have really helped me, I think, figure out how to exercise my voice. Jeff Yang, who is here. Uh, Phil Yu, who is here this morning. Tulane and Array! Shout out to Array. Array is a great, great hey. organization. Come on, Array. Um, uh, April Rain, we mentioned the power of hashtags. We can't, we can't forget April Rain, who got Oscars So White trending. And is a really, really strong, I think, leading force uh, and voice online. Franklin Leonard, also. Gil Robertson, Susan Chang, Angie Han, Dina Ramos, 
Anyways, thank you so much for having me. Thank you guys. Thank Thank you. you.